Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar, Strategies to Engage Your Community on Housing Issues. I'm Melissa Keene. I'm a Senior Program Manager with the Institute for Local Government, and I will be your host and moderator this afternoon. A quick overview of our agenda. We're going to walk through some logistics of the webinar. We're going to do some context setting. Uh, we're going to hear some short presentations from our three presenters today, Wendy, Zelo, and Ruben. And then we're going to engage in a panel discussion to hear a little bit more from each of them on some of these um, topics. We will then have time for Q&A from um, you all as the audience. And then we will uh, share some upcoming webinars with you all and wrap up by 3.30. You've probably noticed that your line has been muted and you will be muted for the duration of today's webinar, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask us questions. So in your control panel, you should see a questions box on that right-hand side of your screen. You can type questions in there um, to us at any point in time during the webinar. Uh, we'll be monitoring those on the back end and responding as appropriate, and then we will um, get to as many of them for our panelists as possible towards the end of today's call. If we don't get to every uh, question, we will also share our contact information at the, at the close, and you can follow up with any of us as needed. We will also be sharing the recording of today's webinar as well as the slide deck with you all. Um, likely early next week, um, so stay tuned for that, but know that we will be recording and sending this out to all of you as well. So a little bit of information about ILG in case you're not very familiar with us. Uh, we are the nonprofit training and education affiliate of the League of California Cities, the California State Association of Counties, and the California Special Districts Association. We provide practical and easy to use resources so that local agencies such as yourselves can effectively implement policies on the ground. We do this in a number of ways. We do a lot of education and training, like today's webinar. We also provide technical assistance, capacity building services, um, and convening services for local governments statewide. We focus on four major program areas. Uh, the first is leadership and governance. Um, so that's kind of your basics information for people who are new to public service, your state mandated training, and a lot of information about how to be effective governance teams and work well uh, between staff and elected officials. We also have a program focused on civics education and workforce. So the goal of that program is really to help create a pipeline to public service um, and let local, um, let young folks know that local government um, is an option as a career path and also help facilitate some of those municipal and school partnerships. We also have an entire program dedicated to public engagement. So you'll hear a little bit about that program here today, um, but it really uh, focuses on trying to embed public engagement into local government operations and help you all just really engage your community more authentically and effectively. And then lastly, we focus on sustainable communities, um, which is also something we'll touch on today. Our housing work is a big piece of that program. But in addition to that, we also do a lot of work on climate action, um, greenhouse gas reduction, saving energy, helping local governments implement sustainability best practices, um, land use, things of that nature. So if you haven't um, gone to our website, definitely encourage you to check that out. We have a lot of free resources that are available to all of you. Um, so before we get started, just would love to get a, a few questions for, here from you all about um, who's in our audience today. So I've got a couple of quick polls um, that I'm hoping you all will respond to. Um, so first up, we'd like to know um, if you're from a city, a county, a nonprofit organization or community-based organization, you're with the private sector or other. I'll give you all just a second here to respond to that. About 75% of you have responded, so we'll give this just another couple of seconds. Great. Um, so it looks like about 70% of you are with cities, 10% with a county, um, almost 10% with a nonprofit, and then we've got another 10% between the private sector and others. So thank you. Next, we're hoping uh, you can let us know if you are an elected official, if you're a planning commissioner, your staff with a local agency, if you're a consultant that works with a local government, um, or again, if none of those accurately reflect. Eighty percent of you have responded, so another second here. Okay. 
Okay, looks like the vast majority of folks on the line are staff, but we do have another, you know, a little over 10% between elected officials and planning commissioners, handful of consultants, and then um, another handful of others. So thank you. And one final question for you all. Um, we're curious about the barriers to housing development in your community. Um, so you can select more than one of these options, but um, when you're thinking about uh, providing housing to your residents, is it community support that's a barrier? Is it developer interest, site availability, funding, or, or other issues? Um, if you are selecting other and you would like to share a little bit more, we would encourage you to, to type that into the questions box as well. We just uh, would love to get that information from you. Give this another few seconds, about 60% have responded. Share this. Um, so unsurprisingly, a lot of you are, are focusing on community support as a challenge, and that's probably why you're on this webinar this afternoon. Um, but that's closely followed by limited site availability. Um, obviously, a lot of folks are flagging funding as a challenge and then developer interest. Um, just curious, Carly or Randy Kay, are you seeing any interesting um, other challenges uh, dropping into the questions box? Uh, just the other one is the Coastal Commission priorities, um, uh, some about staff capacity and development experience among the staff is limited as well. Definitely. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for sharing that with us. Um, it's just helpful as we continue to work in this space and um, as we'll go through today's presentation. Uh, so now that we've heard a little bit about you, um, our presenters this afternoon, in addition to myself, will be Ruben Abrika, a council member with the City of East Palo Alto, Wendy Nowak, a principal with PlaceWorks, which is a consulting firm that works with a lot of local governments on housing element updates and general plan updates and things of that nature, and then Dilo Freitas, who's a senior planner with the City of Arcata. So before we jump into the presentations from our, our panelists this afternoon, um, I want to share one a little bit of information um, with you about how ILG fits into this space um, and then just going to share some um, big picture information about you know what we're hearing in the field um, and kind of our approach to public engagement and why um, why this matters in our opinion. Um, so to start off, um, ILG is part of the statewide technical assistance program um, that has a lot of partners including PlaceWorks, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development, and a number of other um, CBOs and uh, planning firms that are really working to help uh, help you all uh, on the on the housing and planning front um, over the over the last couple of years. Um, so there's a few components of this that we as ILG are involved in. Um, so we're part of the uh, statewide and regional technical assistance team again, and so um, we're we've been meeting with folks regionally throughout the state to really identify again those barriers to housing development what tools and resources and trainings you all need to really do this better. Um, and so we're working on those plans with the Fuller team that should be um, out later this year and the tools are continuing to be developed and released um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, in addition to that, we are also working to update um, our planning commissioner's handbook, which has been one of ILG's flagship resources. Um, and that should be released this fall. And then there will be some companion training that will happen on a regional basis for planning commissioners statewide as well. Um, and then lastly, um, we're doing some local official training, um, which is what this webinar is part of that series. So really training for local elected officials and um, local staff on a number of issues that are related to the, um, the housing topic. Uh, so what we're hearing in the field, working with um, you know, our city and county partners um, as it relates to housing and public engagement, and I'm, I'm betting none of this will really be a big surprise to anybody on the line, um, but a lot of folks are really having challenges navigating the, the hybrid engagement, the reopening, um, and we know that that is changing on pretty much a daily basis at this point with folks going back into the office or um, uh, increased stay-at-home orders, and um, that definitely exacerbates how hard it is to do public engagement when you're trying to navigate both that virtual and in-person and finding that right balance and that right mix. Um, we've heard from a lot of folks 
um, that they're actually seeing more participation in a virtual environment. Um, it's a little bit easier for folks to sign into public meetings from the comfort of their own home instead of having to drive to City Hall or um, county offices on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. Um, definitely easier for them to just connect online um, from their houses. But the flip side of that is um, it's also exacerbating the digital divide. So more participation from folks who have that connection, but in some of the more rural or disadvantaged communities, it's also um, creating another barrier to engagement, essentially, um, for folks that may not have um, broadband access or um, good internet access or even the devices um, by which to connect to some of these meetings. So um, definitely, uh, again, exacerbating that divide between um, those that have easy connections and those that don't. Um, it's also definitely challenging to make virtual engagement interactive. Um, we won't dig into that a ton today, but if you are interested in tips or tools or resources or things like that to make your virtual meetings more um, interactive, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We have a, a ton of information on that um, and some tips that we can share in terms of um, making those meetings a little bit more interactive. Um, on the housing front, uh, we're definitely hearing loud and clear that the arena targets are, are very challenging to meet. Um, we, again, aren't going to dig into that too much today. This is going to be more on the engagement side of things, but um, we just want to recognize that we have heard that. Um, so if you're feeling that in your jurisdiction, you're definitely not alone. And then this is something we'll talk about a little bit more today, but that it's really challenging to balance uh, the housing needs of your community, um, sometimes with the community's vision. So essentially what they, what they say they want may not actually match what uh, needs to happen in your community and how to, how to navigate that can definitely be really challenging. So acknowledging that all of that is really challenging, why, why do this? Um, so we have seen a lot of benefits of doing community engagement and doing it well. Um, on a housing perspective, this definitely can really help you understand that community's vision. And while that still may be a challenge to, to balance that with what the needs are, what the state mandates are, um, it can definitely be helpful from a planning perspective to really understand what your community's vision for their, for their community is. Um, and related to that, it can also help you um, understand their values and ideas and recommendations, particularly when it comes to housing and terms of siting or design or things like that. Um, so I won't, I won't uh, belabor this too much, but obviously it can help increase trust. Um, it can help with project implementation on the back end if you do that um, engagement up front and they feel heard and engaged and part of the process. Um, and lastly, in some cases, it's required. Um, so particularly if you're going through a housing element update or things of that nature, um, there are definitely some spe uh, specific requirements um, as it relates to um, public engagement and how you have to go about that and how, how much engagement you have to have and language requirements and things like that. So um, we definitely see benefits and positives of doing it. And then at the end of the day, sometimes you, you really just have to. Uh, so just really quick frame in terms of how we look at public engagement, um, and this is borrowed from the International Association for Public Participation, or IEP2, um, and you can find more information about this online. Um, but we really look at public engagement as a spectrum. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see um, INFORM, and that's really the general kind of uh, PIO communication function that your city or county or, or nonprofit probably does, um, one-way information out to your community. Um, to inform and educate them about a project that's moving forward or a program that's being implemented or something of that nature. And you see that spectrum go all the way across to the right-hand side, which um, is empower. And that would essentially be turning over decision-making authority to your community. Um, that's often not realistic in the context of local government um, operations and things like that. Um, but the, the key takeaway here is that um, it really is a spectrum and um, being clear about what you're looking for from your community. Are you looking for feedback or are you really just trying to put information out? Um, do you want to form a collaborative environment where um, they're working directly with you on site selection or prioritization or things like that? Or again, is this the decisions about to be made and you really just need to get information out to your community about what's happening? Um, so definitely make sure that you're clear about where you are in this process um, and what feedback you're looking for because there's really no easier way to, to break trust than to go to your community, ask them to spend their time and, and provide feedback and then do nothing with it. Um, so just make sure that you're clear about where you are here and what you're looking for. Um, we'll share this slide deck out and so I, I won't go over this um, in too much detail, um, but this is just um, to highlight that there are in-person engagement activities that go along with each one of those um, 
levels of, of engagement from you know fact sheets and open houses um, to workshops and deliberative polling to advisory committees and things like that and so um, thinking about which options um, correlate to what you're what you're trying to achieve and similar with digital options so um, again these are some digital options that correspond um, to each one of those levels of engagement um, you know static information on your website or a newsletter to surveying and polling or mapping exercises with your community um, things of that nature um, and we also have a lot of information about um, tools that that can um, be used for each of these pieces so again feel free to reach out if you want more information on any of these um, types of things um, and then here's just kind of the, the takeaways in terms of um, if you are staff on the line thinking about strategy around how to do this um, these are just some of the key considerations for you to be thinking about again who's in your community who are you trying to reach what is the purpose of the engagement and what input are you seeking so again are you just looking to send information out and inform and educate or are you really looking for that continued feedback loop and information from your community where are you in the process do you have time to do a really authentic and engaged process or is the decision you know going to council or planning commission in the next couple of weeks and you're really just trying to get information out and then thinking through the tools and approaches that will help you achieve that goal um, so again going back to those last couple of slides what types of engagement activities would really align with that um, and then something that we have always um, suggested is considering a mix of high-tech and low-tech options um, again this really relates to who's in your community um, and who you're trying to reach but um, if you've got a lot of a seniors or a more elderly population you probably don't want to use a ton of high-tech tools that they may not be familiar with or comfortable engaging on and so just thinking again through um, which approaches and which um, options would be best for you and your community so with that I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Wendy and Wendy let me give you control of the screen share hopefully you see that pop up I think you're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch screens here because I want the other screen to show up for you guys. Um, okay, and um, so that should be showing up for you. Are you seeing the full screen of it? Uh, it looks like it's in the edit mode right now. All right. We knew this was gonna happen, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Melissa, can you just do it from yours? I'll stop sharing and then we'll just have it have you flip it for me. Of course. Let me take this back. All right. Thanks, everybody. And of course, the can outreach person has, the, has. Can you see my screen now again? Just want to check. I can see it. We can see it. Okay. And of course, the Perfect. outreach person has the technical issue, but that's, you know, that's that's part of the growth. We we adapt and uh, roll with. So my name is Wendy Novak, and as Melissa said, I work for PlaceWorks. We definitely work on a lot of planning projects, um, but my role in the company is uh, that I lead the outreach practice and arm of our firm. And I'm also a national ambassador for IAP2. So I can go into quite a bit of detail on outreach type things, everything from how to facilitate, how to deal with emotion and outrage. But today we're going to hit high level some things about um, messaging, how to have a conversation with your community on these tough issues, and then just a few tips and tricks that I've been um, hearing some cool things people have been doing along the way that I thought might be neat to share because there were things that I thought were um, interesting as well. Um, and the idea is that um, the tools and the approach that you take will help in this collaborative problem solving approach. When we say getting the yes, but that's really kind of more like, I guess it's okay because nobody's 100% usually on board with every single thing you do in planning. So Melissa, can you go to the next one, please? So the first thing that we really work to do when we're starting out, because obviously on a tough topic like housing, you have to figure out the best way to tell the story because people are feeling like we're getting ideas imposed upon us from the state, from Sacramento, they don't want to do things they don't understand density so immediately there is a resistance to the idea because it might be shifting how they normally do things so when we're having the conversation it's really important to convey what we know and why it matters so it's like here are the rules that are coming down here's who lives in our community here's what our vision statement says about who we want to attract to our community 
this is how we are actually achieving or not achieving those goals right now with the type of housing we have. The conversation is important to phrase in such a way that people understand why they should care about it, period. And we, we look at it from our office, something like I call the grandma test or my mom test. If I'm having a conversation with my mom about housing, why should she care? Like, why would she even show up? Even for me, with there's so many emails and things that we get, I wanna know very quickly, you know, what's happening, what kind of decisions I can have a say in and move forward that way. Um, obviously make it relatable so that if somebody understands how it would influence the way that I do th business in the city, how I live in the city um, is something that's important. It's also important to show what the city's commitment is or the agency's commitment is to this process. So it's like, what, as Melissa was saying, what can the, the community influence? So if they're thinking it's a discussion on housing and it's everything under the sun on housing, that they come in wanting to share certain ideas. If you can frame the conversation in such a way to say, this is what we're talking about today. We may not get to everything you want to talk about, but know that's a foundation for future conversations then they have managed expectations about what's going to be discussed in a meeting and then that way they're not frustrated that they came to talk about something that they're not able to share and then we want to demonstrate after we've had these conversations that we heard the community so everybody usually does summaries or some sort of overview of what came out of each meeting which is very important but it's also important to include you know this kind of dissenting opinion so that everybody can see that their comments were recorded and that they were heard so that even if their direction isn't chosen that they can say that the process was a fair one and that they had an opportunity to show up every step of the way to say what was important to them and to influence that process and that decision and then lastly in that messaging it's coming back so there's touch points with the community probably four or five times here's what we're doing here's what you can decide here's what we can change what we can't Here's what we heard and now what we're gonna do next. So that's that iterative process so that they could see how, how all that um, works together. Next slide, please. One of the biggest challenges we have going into a conversation like housing is that people are already on sides. I want it or I don't, I'm for it or I'm against it. And it's a really tough place to start a conversation because it becomes a battle of wills. I'm right, you're wrong, my idea is better, yours doesn't hold any water. And so you're asking people to get together to come up with solutions. And those types of hardline positions are really tough on relationships because it's a lot of finger pointing instead of collaborating. And so when you, you have those kinds of positions, you know, my way or the highway, you are looking at those kind of unwise agreements. It's not really starting to understand what people's interests are and kind of navigate that conversation. It's pitting one person against another. And so you come out with a lose-lose situation and that's what we want to avoid. And I think half the time people go into really tough, challenging conversations and I'm like, where do we even start? Because that's where everybody is. They start on one side or the other. And the goal of the outreach process is to bring them together in a conversation to come up with solutions. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about positions versus interests, when I'm showing up at a meeting, you can't ask me to put aside the things that are important to me, the things that I care about. However, you can ask me to show up and take a time out and not just autom automatically start advocating for that position saying this is the only way things can be done. You can ask me, to take a, a moment to suspend that position and start to listen to what other people have to say before you start jumping on, this is the absolute only way to go for something. Um, the, the, the thing that we're really seeing that's important for these conversations is to have people take a step back and understand each other, connecting again, instead of just fighting because that doesn't solve anything. And so if you don't have a shared, one of the things that we find is a challenge too in the very beginning of a process is that sometimes people don't have a shared understanding of what the problem is. I might think the problem starts here and this person may think the problem is here. So we've got to make sure everybody's on the same page about the problem that we're trying to solve before we start working forward. Next slide, please. 
So when we start outreach, we start looking at um, with, with a project, we set some ground rules. So whether it's an advisory committee, whether it's a community workshop, we make sure that everybody knows that their perspective is valued. And I think that's common sense. Like, I think we all go into outreach with that intent. But we also ask people to set aside again that position for a moment and take time just to listen to understand, not to debate their partner. So really try to understand everybody else's perspective. One of my favorite things, um, phrases that I use, and we start out a lot of our advisory committee meetings with this, is like, be hard on the issues, but not on people. You can have a good debate all day, but don't make personal attacks, get people off of that. And so as a facilitator, when I'm in the middle of it and people start getting personal, that's when I call a timeout, get everybody to cool off for a second, so that we can get back to talking about those issues and avoid those, I'm right, you're wrong, you're a terrible person because your opinion is different than mine. And so one of the last things we try to get people to do is also remind them that the past is the past. So we'll see somebody bring up, you know, 20 years ago, we did this and that's not what's happening now. And it was so much better back then. And we go, we're starting from a very new starting point and to just take it from there and not drum up everything else that's happened because we can't change that. All we can do is look at what we have and move forward. Next slide. So this is another tool that I use when we are starting out, especially with advisory committee meetings, but it actually works with uh, contentious meetings as well. And this is called the kind of degrees of consensus well, it's not a table, a chart, <laughs> a diagram. Um, but the reality is, is that when we are deciding, even if you're deciding with your friend or your partner where you want to go to dinner, if there's a degree of consensus in there. If I want pizza and the person that I'm going to dinner with wants tacos, if we just say, well, I want this and I'm, I want that, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to eat. Our interest is to find somewhere to eat. So there's usually a compromise somewhere in there. It's like, well, I don't really want pizza. Can we go get Chinese or something else? So that's kind of how the degrees of consensus works. Most of the time, very rarely, you get a decision that's in a one. That's an unqualified yes. 100% agree. Cool. We're right on the same page. Let's move forward or 100% no, which is the six, which is we are nowhere close to being near a conversation. We need to do more work um, before we can even decide on how to move forward. Most decisions are made in that two to three to four area where it's a decision is acceptable and it's the best of the options, or you can live with the decision, but you're not really excited about it or you don't agree with the decision, but I'm not gonna stand in the way of it and prevent things from moving forward. So when people get stuck on those positions one way or the other, I check back in with them to see where exactly are they are in this kind of degree of consensus. Can they live with it? Is it something that they really you know, think we need to just stop everything and, and move forward or not move forward? Um, we also, when somebody is kind of on the fence on these ideas, we put a holding bin, what I call a holding bin. So it's ideas on the side. So that way, if they're not in line with the majority of the group moving forward, we also still capture their ideas and they can see that they are there and can move forward. Next slide, please. So when we talk about collaborative problem solving is getting people off of these positions, the benefits of that is that you can start to see each other's point of view and gain that, you know, oh, we actually have the same interests. We all want wetlands to be restored. We just have different ways of getting to them. We look at those alternatives and the alternatives in some way when you're coming up with those solutions reflect, you know, have a fingerprint of all the different perspectives. And that it's not uncommon that you have solutions that you haven't thought of yet. So when you look at the, the graphic on the right, you know, you see, you know, a position would be it's either cheese or bread. But if if you can get people off of the position and say, look, we're trying to, to make something new and different, and they come up with grilled cheese, like that's a whole other idea that wouldn't have come out of the process if we didn't get people off of their positions. Next slide. So here, that's a, a high level overview just of, of how to have conversations and discussions, but there's a few other things 
that I wanted to share because we are in this hybrid world and we've been virtual for quite some time and have had to really adjust and adapt to how we communicate. And so we have to get creative in the way that we connect. What I'm seeing is that we have had a lot of people engage online, which has been wonderful. All these people we haven't been able to get to because they have work lives or kids activities. They're now able to join in the conversation at their own pace. But we also have this need to get in front of people and actually sit down and talk to them and have more one-on-one -on -one with people that aren't able to get online and be digital. So we've got uh, you know, visioning opportunities, we've got mapping, um, but we also have to be creative and kind of get out of the, the normal way of doing things and kind of get what I say into the marketing mindset. So for instance, um, I was on a webinar and the city of Oakland was talking about um, an online activity that they did and they partnered with DoorDash and was able to get a grant or I don't know stipend from DoorDash so that the people that were participating could get either DoorDash delivered or they got credit so I need to learn more about that but that was kind of an interesting thing so DoorDash gets promotion which I'm still talking about them now and then people that are at home are able to get kind of a reward for participating um, and then you know, the things that we also need to think about is connecting those, um, using, leveraging the community connectors. So we have always talked about, and, and most people use like, um, you know, the, the well-known folks in the community to really kind of give us a pulse about what's going on. And religious organizations have been one of those areas. Now, one of the things to think about is you know, we're trying to figure out how to do these hybrid meetings, which haven't, you know, we've worked on it with a couple different jurisdictions. And what we're finding is that they don't have the auto visual setup to do a good job. Either they've got the cameras, but you can't hear what people are saying, or it's at a dais kind of setup, which isn't conducive for collaboration. And so, you know, some of the things to think about is that some of the religious organizations had to go virtual as well when we went into the pandemic. So if certain jurisdictions don't have access to good AV equipment, they may be actually um, you know, having their um, weekly services and have that online. So they may be an opportunity for you. And just lastly, thinking about how when you roll out your messaging on something to make it clean and creative, because for instance, if you think about Nike, if they had a new high top that came out, if you saw a notice, a public notice for a Nike high top, and it's like, um, you know, shoe with laces, has a design on the side, you know, it wouldn't be that exciting. You wouldn't care about it. But when you think about how they advertise or they promote, now obviously we're not gonna promote it with the same kind of flash that Nike would, but the idea is that you're really getting something that's getting people excited. So you know, find ways to, to make it fun and interesting and kind of get a, you know, a, a campaign behind it so that they will, um, that messaging will stick and they'll really want to, to try to get engaged. I have a lot of other things to say, but I'll save it for questions for later. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, and uh, as a quick reminder to all of the audience, um, definitely feel free to drop questions into the questions box if anything came up during Wendy's presentation or um, as we go through the next couple of quick um, presentations, and we'll get to those um, towards the end of the call. Um, so next up, we have Zillow from the city of Arcata. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the presenter duties over to you. Hopefully, you see that pop up. I do. Let's see here. Okay. Um, oops. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Is this technology the same so funny, guys? Okay. Are we seeing my slide deck? Yes, it does look like it's in presenter mode, though, so it's not full screen. Okay. Everybody's just switched. Hmm, nope, looks like that's what we're going to get. Like, can you, hmm. I think maybe I'll just have to be the vote as Wendy. Maybe you should just do my slides for me. I can do that. Okay. All right, let me, I'll take back control. 
Okay, I was so excited. I thought that was really going to work, but you know what? That is part of the game. Okay, so <laughs> my name is Bilo, and I'm a senior planner at the City of Arcata, and I am far from a leading expert in the field of uh, public engagement, but my professional background has really lent itself to this topic. Um, I've been a planner for about six or seven years now, and I've worked at three different jurisdictions up here in Northern California. I started at the city of Eureka when they were working on their housing element update, as well as a comprehensive general plan update and an update to their zoning code. And then I went to the private sector and worked for a private uh, firm and was a contract planner for the city of Ferndale. And they also had to update their housing element while I worked for them, and I worked with them to apply for their SB2 funds. And now I run our engagement for our infill program at the city of Arcata, which I'm going to be talking with you about today. And I have also returned to the city of Eureka as a planning commissioner. So I've kind of seen it from both sides and I'm really excited to talk to you about some of my takeaways from my experiences. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just start with a little bit about Arcata so you could understand the context of my community. Arcata is a small progressive college town. You can kind of think of a mini Berkeley or Davis. Lots of natural beauty, uh, lots of college students. We have a population of about 18,000 and about one third of our population is Humboldt State University students. Our unofficial city motto is where the 60s meet the sea. And definitely people see themselves as artistic, progressive, eco-conscious and welcoming as a community. On the other hand, though, we definitely have an issue with housing and have for decades. We have the second highest student homelessness rate in the CSU system. And we also have been identified the Humboldt Bay region as one of the 15 hottest markets in the US right now. And I think that's partially due to teleworking and cost of living in other areas of the state, as well as climate and fire refugees who are coming to coastal areas. And to top it off, we also were very recently identified as uh, the CSU system's third polytechnic. So we're planning to have another 5,000 students on top of our highest ever enrollment. And we are simply not prepared to accommodate that kind of growth. So we are turbocharging everything. <laughs> Next slide, please. So one of the issues uh, that we have been strategizing is how to provide all of this housing, all of this development when we're really physically constrained. So if we build to the east, we would build into hillside areas that are completely forested. If we build into the northwest, it's all prime ag soils, relatively untouchable, and it would all need to be annexed anyway. And if we build to the southwest, it's super susceptible to sea level rise and the Coastal Commission does often provide a barrier to intense development. So we have to focus on infill development. Next slide, please. And this has led us to what we're calling our strategic infill redevelopment program. And we're calling it a program because it comprises all these different plans and updates to our general plan, um, our vision statement that guides the general plan, our local coastal element, and our zoning code. And uh, next slide. All of this has had a really intensive community engagement element to it, uh, not only with our updating of our housing element in 2019, but also with more recent work that has had to do with one of our targeted infill priority development areas, what we're calling the gateway area, uh, which is directly west of our downtown core. It's currently zoned by industrial, and we're planning to rezone all of it to something that's uh, more amenable to housing creation. So, I am going to go now into my four big takeaways. And our first one, next slide please, is prepare for cognitive dissonance. And I know this is a group of mostly planners, so I'm not gonna um, really dwell on this too much. I'm sure it's preaching to the choir, but this slide should really read how to prepare for cognitive dissonance and ultimately move past it. <laughs> And we don't talk enough about psychology and planning and in politics, in my opinion. I took an economics course, and the very first lesson was about how psychology influences decision making and finance. But we don't have a similar conversation in planning, which is so bizarre to me when it's really applied poly science that we aren't having these conversations. But cognitive dissonance is defined as holding two conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes, resulting in mental conflict. Uh, and a dissonance between belief and actions. 
And we need to be prepared for that as a classic example of human behavior and be prepared to call attention to it and work through it with our community. And, you know, not in my backyard mentality is obviously really challenging, but people who showcase that behavior aren't morally deficient, they're just humans and they're struggling with cognitive behavior, which is totally normal. And that also doesn't mean that what we're doing by proposing housing is wrong or bad. Uh, so how do we acknowledge and normalize this phenomenon, but also begin to unpack it? And that's the hard part. One of those things um, that you can work on, though, is talking about community values, sort of like what Wendy was talking about. Take a step back. Don't let it be about the project. Let it be about the community. And talk about what's important. Is it, um, you know, small town charm? Is it being welcoming? Is it having more families? Is it having more economic opportunity? And use that to sort of prioritize what you're going to be moving toward. And I don't have time to go into um, what this gentleman's presentation was on my slide, but if you have eight minutes, I would highly, highly recommend that you watch it. I have the link here. Uh, basically, he goes into how values really skew the way we develop housing and really goes into this cognitive dissonance concept, and it's absolutely fabulous. And um, next slide, please. The other thing that you can try is polarity mapping. And we actually provided some of our polarity mapping slides from our housing element workshops attached to this presentation. And this is really meant to get people thinking about um, sort of the polar opposites of two sides of a position. And the intent is to have them do this collaboratively in a meeting together so they can think through sort of the pros and cons of focusing on two separate values. Um, and that's a great way to really get people thinking through extreme positions and getting off those sort of ideological high, high points. Next slide, please. And that kind of leads into the next point I want to make as well, which is always, always, always be proactive to the extent that you can. And what you don't want is to have somebody's first exposure to a project be when it's at the hearing for its approval. You want them to have a lot of opportunity to give feedback about the way development is happening in advance of that, ideally as part of your housing element. And you really do need to go back to the vision statement. If they're saying they want community inclusion and diversity and opportunity, then you need to find ways to tie that back to the fact that they need to be able to welcome new neighbors. And this is a great opportunity too to identify areas of town that have a high likelihood of redevelopment even before a project is proposed. And that's what we did in the city of Arcata as part of our housing element is prioritize four different areas throughout the city that have a pretty high likelihood for redevelopment based on their current zoning and just lack of um, built out land. So it's really important to the extent that you can to do that in advance and take a step back with your community and talk about how they wanna grow, acknowledging change is inevitable. Next slide, please. So I'm also gonna talk about messaging and my points are a little bit different than Wendy's, but really at the end of the day, you need to refine your messaging and you need to have a united front as staff and also as a council, because you are all sort of mouthpieces to explain what you're doing and why it's so important to the community. And I wanted to touch on a couple things here. The first being, it's really helpful to parse out affordable housing a little bit. And what I mean by that is you can be a high earner and still qualify for low mod assistance, depending on where you are located. My friend, Elise Adams, who's my friend who's by with six, is a teacher. She works in Fremont. She has a master's degree and she qualifies for affordable housing. She qualifies for subsidy, even though she makes $70,000 a year and she works every day. And I think it's important to explain housing as a key opportunity for young people and professionals and families. And it's there um, to support people who are taking care of themselves, but really aren't able to spend more than 30% of their income on housing and shouldn't be expected to. And the second thing is try and get your team on the same page with messaging and have talking points and refer to the same documents to the extent that you can. OPR and HCD have a ton of resources on this stuff, including this one here. This is from OPR about infill development, and they're talking about it's so important to do infill because it reduces uh, stormwater runoff and it reduces costs of maintaining your infrastructure and it facilitates healthy and environmentally friendly active transportation and brings vibrancy to your neighborhood. 
like you can all say this, you can all reference this. And um, we could not only get our messaging all on the same page citywide, we could do it statewide. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I mean, these resources are here for us to use. Um, also a great document is the California Statewide Housing Assessment. They literally break it down with talking points before you even open the document. And I have it here. One third of renters pay more than 50% of their income on rent. Home ownership rates are the lowest in California since the 1940s. California accounts for a disproportionate amount of the nation's homelessness population at 22%. Production averaged less than 80,000 new homes annually over the last 10 years, and ongoing production continues to fall below the projected need of 180,000 additional homes annually. So this is all out there. You just have to find it. And the state is really trying to make it easy for us to uh, get the messaging out and have it be consistent. Next slide. Okay, so this is my final slide, and this is not housing specific, but it's super important. And I think that Melissa kind of touched on this, uh, and Wendy too. And big shout out to the Booth team for all their help to my city on this work. But first and foremost, you need to be prepared. And intentionality to me means knowing why you're engaging people and how you plan to use it. And even writing it straight into your agenda. You can have it right at the top, intended outcomes of this meeting, and make sure it's articulated. And it means practicing in advance and having answers to hard questions prepared so you all are on the same page about how you're going to answer them. And it means training staff to facilitate and capture feedback from all attendees, not just the people who are talking loudest. And finally, intentionality really calls for us to reframe engagement because every public meeting is a community gathering and it has real power to shift narratives and build trust and build connection. And if you don't do it right, it can totally have the opposite effect. <laughs> and I know that you're all here because you don't want that to happen. So you can think of every meeting as sort of a party and the art of gathering is a book I'm reading, which is very thought provoking and interesting. And it goes into all the things you need to think about picking the right size space, having follow up with your attendees, specific invites to people that you want to be there. Very uh, good and I would definitely recommend it. Next slide. So bottom line, just be intentional and proactive and be prepared for some irrationality in your community and you need to work through it and uh, lean on state level guidance for assistance to the extent that you can. And know that we're in a really exciting time where social media and virtual and in-person formats can build a lot of flexibility and opportunity for us to get creative with engagement. And thanks again to Boost for supporting my community and inviting me here today. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, Zulo. Um, the mapping exercise slides that she mentioned are included in the handout um, that you should see on your control panel as well. So if you're interested in learning more about um, their process, definitely um, take a look at that handout as well. Um, and just another quick reminder to go ahead and drop questions in. I've seen a number come through, but if you have more questions, um, feel free to send them our way. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ruben Abrika, who's a council member in East Palo Alto, to talk a little bit about the elective official perspective and um, what they've done in, in East Palo Alto. Ruben? Uh, yes, well, thank you. I'm very interested to hear my uh, Two previous uh, uh, colleagues presenting. So my name is Ruben Abrica. Uh, I'm a council member in the city of East Palo Alto. Was elected in 2004. Uh, as it turns out, this is my second round because when I was much younger back in the 80s, I also served on the city council. I was involved in the movement to incorporate because we were unincorporated San Mateo County. Um, I served on the uh, city council for five years. So. Uh, you know, I want to share some of my perspective on this whole area of community engagement and the importance uh, of strengthening that and how elected officials can do that, uh, particularly working with, with our city staff. A, a little bit about our city. We were 30, about 30,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, we're very small uh, area, two, two and a half square miles. Southern San Mateo County. And um, we're one of those local minority, minority uh, communities for over 50 years. It used to be primarily African-American and now it's predominantly Latino. But we have uh, 
populations of Asian Islanders, uh, European Americans, um, and uh, you know a few Native Americans. We're also primarily a low uh, moderate income community, and uh, you know we're smack in the middle of Silicon Valley, so we're surrounded by you know fairly wealthy or at least wealthier communities, and so we kind of stand out in, uh, a little bit. Um, I, I'm also a, a full-time instructor at the Anza Community College, uh, recently sort of semi-retired, but uh, the, the, uh, uh, the combination for me of serving on the council and uh, being an instructor, perspective I feel of always trying to learn and try to teach what I've learned just by being part of the, the city council. You know, our, our community is probably much more on the spec on the side of the spectrum of cities that have put in place many uh, uh, provisions, policies, ordinances to support affordable housing. We actually started in 1984 with the passage of a rent stabilization and just cost eviction law, which has uh, helped to prevent displacement, although it continues to be, um, you know, a challenge. We've also enacted uh, commercial impact fees that provide some funding for housing. Uh, we have a transient occupancy, occupancy um, uh, tax that also provides a portion of the money for affordable mm -hmm. housing. Most recently in the last 10 years, the voters approved a small tax on large landlords that also, um, uh, that money provides assistance uh, for people who may be facing displacement. Uh, one of the perhaps most innovative um, uh, things that the council did is we put on the on the on the ballot a measure to tax uh, office developer developments 25,000 square feet or, or larger and the money coming in from that uh, which we're starting to now uh, uh, get some of those funds is to specifically uh, build affordable housing and it's really defined as low income low moderate income uh, housing. Uh, the rest of the money can also be used for uh, training, workforce training for high tech and building trade. So um, we're also currently, uh, another example of some of the things we've been trying to do is that we're currently engaged in, in a effort to preserve a mobile home park that uh, the owners want to sell. And we're uh, partnering with some nonprofit developers uh, as well as foundations to try to preserve it and, and actually buy it from the owner and, and maintain it as a, a affordable housing. And most interestingly, uh, we, we, we have received an application from a current uh, uh, large uh, landlord who wants to kind of redevelop uh, an area that is primarily uh, uh, multiple housing. And uh, we had put in place a inclusionary um, inclusionary housing ordinance that requires 20% of the units to be uh, low income. And so, uh, you know, this is a, something that's uh, in process, and but it, it has helped us to uh, uh, keep, keep the issue of affordable housing, uh, you know, alive and trying to address the need. Um, so, you know, as, as a council member, obviously, you know, we're not, the, is the staff people, and I know there's plenty, uh, you know, majority of staff on the on the webinar who really do the the work on the front line to uh, enhance community engagement. But I just I want to make three, um, I guess, would be kind of reminders or tips, uh, suggestions to elected officials, and, and something for staff to maybe know about uh, how we approach this in a way. So first one is that uh, I feel as elected officials, we want to put community engagement, the community engagement first and politics second. Why do I say that? Because we know that the council is, will be the ultimate decision maker. So that kind of, that, that's an example of, uh, I guess, our representative democracy uh, at work. We're elected, we represent the voters, and then we make decisions. But I see community engagement as an example of participatory democracy. Uh, and, and so I think we need to take it very seriously as elected officials because 
we can do a lot to encourage that and to support those efforts uh, you know, in a variety of ways. We can reach out ourselves to all the networks that we have, not only people that support us or support our point of view, if we already have made our, our, our minds up, but really to invite uh, others, invite other groups, invite the leaders of other groups, uh, particularly, uh, you know, populations that have traditionally been left out. So, you know, whether they are language groups, whether they're uh, tenant, uh, whether they're seniors, that we, uh, by virtue of our uh, position as elected officials, after all, you know, we got elected because we campaigned. We had to go talk to everybody, or we try to talk to everybody, right? So whether we agree or disagree, I think we have that uh, leverage that that can help to uh, bring people in and encourage them to uh, to be part of the process. Uh, another reminder to us as uh, elected officials is that I think it's important to give clear direction to the city manager and then to offer assistance. Why? Because uh, I think there's times when staff members may feel that they're out there by themselves, you know, in, in either the planning department or the housing department. And it's really the council that can, uh, in the public, uh, you know, engage the city manager and say, uh, you know, do you need more resources to have more meetings? We'd rather have more meetings rather than less meetings if we're trying to engage all the different uh, groups in the community. Uh, the, you know, are, are there, are you prepared for um, language interpretation? Uh, you know, are, are you translating some materials? Maybe not all of them, but in, into Spanish or, you know, Chinese or Tongan in our case and whatever language our community has. Uh, the, the uh, it, you know, are, are you engaging the whole team? I think that that's important that um, when we're trying to really enhance the community engagement, we're trying to get as many people on board. And so um, that is one of the leverages that we have, that we are collectively the boss of the city manager of the top management, and they need to, uh, 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 you know, throughout the organization, encourage and support this. But it starts with us. We need to let, let it be known that we want to help you. We want to help the staff. Uh, we can also help with our own contacts that we have in the community, and give them to um, to the staff, and and also uh, make the rounds. Like I said, just like we do campaigns, we can make the rounds virtually or in person. Uh, anytime there is some community engagement meeting. Uh, in this case, having to do with housing, for example. And the last recommendation or, you know, reminder to, to us as elected officials is to, to study up on the facts and the policies and the laws, uh, because it, it, as you know, as elected officials, other than big cities, we're not there full-time. It's not our full-time occupation. We're not necessarily experts on the uh, topics. And so we need to study and, and that's, uh, that's what we need to do, remind ourselves. Um, and uh, that can include key policy, uh, whether it's the housing element or the um, uh, general plan uh, that already has, uh, you know, a lot of information, already has some aspects of community visioning, although it's always in, in, in process. And also we can find gaps sometimes where, uh, in study, studying our own uh, situation in our particular communities, uh, again, you know, with the help of staff, in a way they can brief us, we may find out that you know, there's a certain policy that perhaps we need to consider putting in place uh, in, in, uh, or an ordinance or something that, or put something before the voters in order to, in this case, uh, not only increase the, uh, engagement on, on housing, but try to bring some solutions to it. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop right there with those three uh, reminders. Like I said, I've been in city government for a long time, but I keep reminding me of those of those things. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, and now we're going to go into a, a panel discussion and then take some questions from the audience as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share here so we can see all of the panelists again. Perfect. 
So this has been touched on a little bit, but I, I think that this is something that a lot of the jurisdictions on the line probably are struggling with is, again, trying to find that balance between what the community identifies as their vision and what they really want the community's needs in terms of what the housing um, patterns are looking like um, and all of those types of things. And then obviously you have some state mandates on this front too. So I'm, I'm curious if you guys can talk a little bit about um, some strategies to maybe help balance that out. Um, Zilo, I know you touched on this a little bit in your presentation and how um, you guys have a really big need coming up, um, both with your student population and things like that. So wondering if you might be willing to kick us off and just share some additional thoughts on how you guys are approaching that and, and trying to find that balance. Sure, yeah, I think that the Polytechnic designation has been a blessing for me <laughs> and the work that I do because we started this planning work years ago and are now finally getting to the point where we have something to show to the public and all of a sudden the Polytechnic designation happens and so everyone is like, yes, please, thank you, please build housing, we need it so badly. So it's really helped people in Arcata understand that what we are doing is being very strategic with the way we're providing housing. And Arcata has always had a really strong set of greenbelt policy. We definitely protect our ag lands and our forest lands with the intent of infilling into the urban core. And really what we're doing now is just trying to turn that to 11 and really make it successful. We're talking about four, five, six, story buildings in our downtown, which is totally new and pretty freaky. You know, I think that community character is really important to Arcata. A lot of people move here from other parts of the state to try and have like a rural feel, a small town feel, um, but they really have to make a judgment call about how that lines up with the way they want to treat our natural resources lands and how they want to see themselves as being community minded. So I think the Polytechnic designation has really helped us um, with that argument. And in our survey, our visioning survey that we released, we asked the question specifically, what do you see as your community's values? And I would say easily two thirds of the participants said, you know, community inclusiveness, equity, um, they want to be that person. And so we're going to let them be their best selves by creating that kind of city. Perfect, thank you. So it sounds like you are really just finding a balance and you have a couple of external factors that have helped you make that case, but um, you're also doing that proactive engagement to, to hear from your community and, and really um, internalize their values. Wendy, I know this is something that you also um, deal with a lot and you talked about this a little bit in terms of your messaging, um, things like that, but any strategies that folks could consider um, when they're having these public meetings, when they're going out to engage their community to, to try to find that right balance? You know, it is hard because most people don't even know what the vision of the city is, right? So to go back and say, okay, when I talked about like working on the same problem, like working from the same starting point, just going back to that and going, okay, this is what we want our community to be. Now, the hard part is, is that if it's always been small town character, but you know the only way to satisfy some of your housing requirements or maybe to bring in young families is to bring in higher density uses. It's having that conversation with, here's the trade-off. Well, first of all, I mean, obviously we have state requirements, but what we're finding is, um, for example, I'm working in Palm Springs and the conversation there has been around, you know, obviously it's an aging community and it's trending that way. It's going faster than any other area out in the desert. And they have in their vision statement that they want it to be a family oriented community. So they had to go back and check and look at, okay, what does that translate to policies wise? So if we can't have families that can afford homes or if we have affordable housing, but we have a lot of senior affordable housing and the wait list for a, uh, a family housing is a very long time. People just have to leave because there's nothing. So it starts to shift that. And so it's, it is that messaging. So it's not just from staff, because I think, you know, Ruben's talking about it too. It's like, everybody is saying the same thing. Like, look, this is important to us. We've said that we've tested this vision. It's important to us. So we're gonna have to make some decisions, some tough decisions about what that means and how we evolve, how the community evolves 
but still can maintain. So if there's certain things about the character people like, well, let's see if we can accommodate that density, but find those features. If it's green spaces, if it's an architectural style, if it's the way the sidewalk works. So it's, it's trying to blend it all. I mean, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it, but it goes back to having that conversation with the community about the trade-offs. It's like, this is important for us to have families here and this is how we're going to do it. This is one of the ways. If you say no, no density, then then you're making a conscious choice that you don't want these things. No, perfect. Definitely making sure you're outlining those uh, those trade-offs and being clear with the community because uh, it goes back to Delo's presentation about the cognitive dissidences that they they say they want one thing, but then they also say they want the other. And so very important to have those um, those clear and frank conversations with the community. Um, Ruben, want to go back to your presentation a little bit, and um, obviously we've we've heard from both staff and the elected officials on on this call, um, but obviously both play a very key role in community engagement and in housing. Um, so curious to hear a little more from you in terms of how can elected officials and staff be more mutually supportive. Um, so from your perspective as an elected official, and then um, Dilo and Wendy, if you have anything to add from more of the staff side of things, would love to hear that as well. But um, any tips on how to be a more united team, a more supportive team on both sides of that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, you know, that's been a long interest of mine, kind of a gray area where uh, I think we always maybe second guessing each other, the city council, because we're the politicians, and it, the staff is trying to figure out where we're going. And then we're looking at the staff as like, they should do everything and they should do it perfectly. And I think that, you know, the reason I thought of the word even participatory democracy is because I feel that if we if we activate our own uh, networks uh, of people, not in a political way, but to say, look, uh, you know, this this community meeting is taking place. These are the staff, uh, the people who are working on it. And so, you know, get people there so that uh, the staff can do their presentations and if you have any questions that will answer them later we'll get to the politics you know the the, the, the maybe the more heavy duty politics right now just try to learn get your voice out there uh, and, and so i think just encouraging that communication obviously with the city manager being okay that there should be more dialogue and more support uh, once it gets to the decision making point well then at that point yes it will be up to the city council and the staff um, will have to follow whatever the decision is. But I think there's a lot of opportunities that we miss. Uh, the groups that we know just uh, repeat, you know, part of communication is just reminding people over and over and over again. Here's this opportunity. If you miss that one, there will be another one. Go to that. I think sometimes we don't do enough of that. You know, we just wait until we're going to make the decision. And that's when we make speeches about it. <laughs> no, definitely. And that also reinforces uh, Dula's point about being proactive and uh, modeling that proactive engagement. Um, so curious from your perspective, Dilo, um, from the staff side, uh, any thoughts on this question and how you all worked with your council perhaps um, on this front? Yeah, so I guess I'll just share um, a move that our mayor did, Sophia Pereira, that I really admired. So she has been on the council for a while, served as um, a councilwoman and as the mayor. That's the way our system works as it kind of revolves. Um, and she is well versed enough in the way the system works now that she was able to collaborate with staff as we started our visioning in a really unique way. So for a little bit of background, we have a five member council, three were just up for re-election, all three seats were shifted. Nobody rewon their seat. So we had three new council people who had been doing a lot of canvassing because they were trying to get elected. So they had all of this really fresh content from people. They'd done door knocking, they'd done tabling. And one of the first things the mayor did is have them report out at their first meeting what their main takeaways were that they heard when they did the, their canvassing. And then she took those um, main points that they all shared. It was, you know, safety and homelessness and housing for students and economic development and COVID safety. And she formed five different focus groups 
and those focus groups informed our annual goal setting. And she invited staff to sit in on those meetings in order to basically inform the work we're doing for our city visioning. So we have this really fabulous cross pollination where they were sort of gathering their own information, facilitating their own sessions and working collaboratively with staff to capture that information. And then I was able to translate that into some of the starting content for our first visioning session. So it was this great collaborative cross pollination and it really was a great way to elegantly use the information that they'd been collecting on their own and not just assuming that we couldn't use it as staff or didn't need it. Uh, I think you guys hit on some of the same same things, open lines of communication, um, being proactive, being collaborative, and really um, working towards, again, what's good for your city or your county or your jurisdiction and um, having having the city uh, council and the or your board of supervisors and the, the local jurisdiction staff um, working to, in the same direction towards the same goals. Um, and that can only be done, obviously, with open communication and continuous communication and collaboration. So um, thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, looking at some of the questions that we're getting in from the audience, um, Wendy, this might be, be something you've got some tips on, but Ruben or Dilo obviously chime in as well. Um, we, we talked about, you talked about community connectors and finding, you know, whether they were nonprofits or faith-based organizations or other folks that can really help amplify messaging. Um, there's a couple questions specifically more targeted at uh, local businesses. So any thoughts on um, how to how to include businesses in some of these these outreach activities? Obviously, for infill in particular, they might be impacted by that. So, um, anything to share there? Yeah, and I guess it depends on the topic because you know obviously you have stakeholder meetings. So sometimes you can have an advisory committee of stakeholders focused on those particular issues because or like when we work on general plans, you know we're looking at that balance of housing to you know uh, jobs, right? So when we're looking at uh, different businesses, there's a lot of different ways. In Moore Park, the businesses are they, are, they know exactly what's going on. We have talked to all of them. They take flyers, they put them in all the windows about the meetings. We, um, the city has done even little interesting things like collaborating with one of the local restaurants. The city went out and had posters made that said general plan update with the, um, the website. And so when everybody's putting their drink down, they're seeing all of that. So they are, you know, the size community, they're very close. They're very connected communities. So everybody knows kind of what's going on. So I guess from a, involving businesses, it's you can have targeted because there may be specific issues that are specific to them about how they grow, how they work, the issues that they're having. So I don't know if it's a matter of, um, you know, it, it depends what the, the business um, issues are depending on how you would engage them because you can engage them as a broader and have their own focus area or you could make sure that you're addressing those issues in the topics that you're talking about for all of your workshops um, I think and this may be um, Dilo and, and Ruben you might be able to speak to this side of it but um, I think it may relate to the the workforce housing um, component and so I think that um, some of the businesses are also very interested in this topic from a workforce perspective, if they don't have employees that can live in their community because they've been priced out of the market or the, the housing stock just isn't there. Um, and, I, and I think that that's probably a, a challenge in both of your cities. Um, Dilo or, or Ruben, either of you want to speak to speak to that? Yeah, let me um, maybe start a little bit on, um, you know, sort of regional issues, right? Because for us, for example, uh, I mentioned the tax uh, measure that was approved by the voters, which will provide some funds to help us with that. Uh, but there is this regional imbalance. And so we always remind our local neighbors that, you know, I, I think they, they haven't built enough uh, low income housing, for example, even moderate income housing for their own reasons, right? They got their, their own politics. But uh, we provide a lot of the labor force for a certain uh, you know, segment of the economy, a lot of service employee, you know, people who do service jobs, not, not very high paying jobs. And so uh, we find ourselves in that situation where, um, well, you know, that, that we encourage uh, without interfering, that we encourage other cities to, to look at the broader picture of what, what the workforce is 
and our respective responsibilities and how we can address it for the better of the, of the you know betterment of the region because uh, you know we're doing what we can uh, and like I said it, it opens up an interesting discussion uh, to 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 really again have have honest conversations about it and and see what we could come up perhaps like uh, Wendy was saying you know instead of a no no we could just agree that we will make something happen somehow uh, that will be good for everybody yeah housing housing shortages don't know jurisdictional boundaries right particularly in parts of the state where um, the cities are so close together like where you are Ruben and um, Dila it looks like you unmuted yourself did you have something to add yeah um if I'm understanding the question which I think I am one thing that I would say is partly it's a messaging thing and an expectations <laughs> thing one thing that we really like to hit home to people is that housing creation relies on many many complex factors including market forces and interest rates and climate change and all these things that are totally out of our control but what we do have control over is our city's policy and our city's procedures and how hard they are to get through and that's what we can work at to try and make it more streamlined. And that's what we can offer. So, you know, that's really where we're focusing our efforts in the city of Arcata. Um, and that's just what I wanted to add to that. No, thank you so much for that. Um, we've got a few questions in terms of, of the length of the process. And I, I, I know that, Wendy, you're probably going to say it depends. Um, but any good rule of thumb on time frame um, in terms of, of engagement on some of these activities. Um, obviously, there are some external deadlines and timelines that have to be taken into account. But in the perfect world, um, how long would you like for this kind of process? <laughs> I think this is where I start. You're right, asking a thousand questions. How many different groups are we engaging? To what degree? Are we doing <laughs> online? Are we, um, you know, are we doing one on ones? Are we doing translation? Um, so you really have to identify those touch points, right? So if we're talking about, let's just say, I mean, because there's housing development and then there's housing elements. So like right now, when we're dealing with housing elements, we're having to work backwards from state mandates. So you had even hit it up front. It's like, do you even have time? Like, what do you have time for? So if you have six months, then you take six months and you go, okay, who do we need to talk to? How do you fit it in? Um, you know, so we need to have three community outreach meetings. Okay, that's all we're going to be able to do. So then we do the online in between. Um, if, you know, it's a <laughs> utopian planning, you know, it's like, okay, Wendy, you don't have all, all day in a whole year to do outreach. Um, even then people would say that's not enough or I didn't get a chance to participate, right? So, you know, it could take, it could take six months. I mean, you got to get people up to speed on what the project is, then you um, are doing a little homework that you have to have something to come back to them with. So it's really the in-between work and those things that you're presenting to them on decision making. So yeah, I'm sorry to put it back on your, it depends, but uh, <laughs> it, it does, it depends on the decision that you're trying to get them to make. Sure. And it also depends, you know, I hate to say this, but we had a project in Long Beach that we'd been working on and the project had been it was a specific plan on 1500 acres and it had a couple bad starts and the community was not having it. They were going, well, good luck with this. We did this, this is not gonna work. And it also had coastal commission and that one took 10 years. But what I'm saying is the city did right size the outreach. So by the time it was done, it didn't need outreach for 10 years. It was just the steps it took that nobody questioned, not everybody agreed with the outcome but nobody questioned the process and that they had an opportunity to engage. And that is what you want to make sure your process has set up, that there's not any reason that there wasn't a touch point for somebody to engage, like Ruben was saying, every step of the way if they wanted to. Yeah, no, I, and that's why I started there, because that would have been my response <laughs> to when it really kind of depends. It depends on what you're trying to achieve, what your timeline, your realistic timeline is that you have to work with. Um, what feedback you're looking for from the community, what tools you have at your disposal. Um, so I know that's not, again, a perfect answer, but um, really make sure you're touching on all of the things that um, Wendy just, just mentioned. Budget, staff capacity, timeline, all of those things are super important when thinking through the, the approach and the timeline. 
Um, we've gotten a couple of questions. Oh, sorry, Ruben, something to add? You know, I was going to add something that we're actually going through that in East Palo Alto right now with a developer who wants to uh, rehabilitate some housing units and then create new ones. And so uh, we have a requirement for a pre-application process where even before the actual application for the development is put in, uh, the developer does community meetings themselves. So the city doesn't do them, but they have to do it. So they it's an initial opportunity for the community, right? Of course, some people go to those meetings and think that the decision's already going to be made, but not at all. And then at some point, the city council, our staff also does uh, some meetings. And then we encourage community groups themselves to invite the developer and say, hey, come and tell us what, what you're planning. Uh, and, then, and then it goes back to the city council. So I have found that to be really important to even if it, if it gets delayed, uh, it's okay, as long as the developer feels that okay they, they can take more time they're okay with it right at some point it, it they may say well we're not going to spend any more time that's it but i think it's important to open it up uh, because that does offer more opportunity and so so far that's been actually good because a couple of times it seemed like they may not work at all but the developers said we say well go back and you know look at this to comply with this so then they go back and uh, anyway, that, so that's one tool that we have used, sort of a pre-application process. It's much more open conceptually, and people almost start from ground zero in a way. And then it keeps building and evolving more. Thank you. Yeah, so you get some initial feedback before you're too far down the process too. So that's um, a definitely a good tool. And I think you also mentioned being as flexible with deadlines and timelines as possible we obviously understand that some of those are beyond your control as a city or county but for internal deadlines if there is flexibility um, making sure you um, are taking the appropriate amount of time to engage your community um, so doing a quick time check here we've got about five more minutes so let's um, i think we can get through one more question and then um, i do have some resources i want to share with um, with the group um, and again, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Definitely feel free to reach out to us. I'll put our contact up, in, our contact information up in just a second. Um, but we have received a couple of questions, and I don't think these will be a surprise to anybody on the line, um, about NIMBYs and political will in more wealthy neighborhoods that might be resistant to affordable housing. Um, any quick, quick tip? I know that we could probably have an entire hour and a half conversation just about this. Um, but any any quick thoughts from you all in terms of um, how to win them over, for lack of a better word? <laughs> I mean, I think partially it comes down to trying to understand their values and show, like showing them the mirror, you know, being like, this is what you said you cared about, and that's what we're trying to provide for you. And just acknowledging you will never make everyone happy. It's impossible. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong or bad. In fact, it's a state mandate. So, you know, I think that that is partially just something to be anticipated and work through to the extent that it's feasible. And I'm sure that there are other philosophies on it, um, but that's mine. Thank you. Wendy or Ruben, any thoughts on that question? Yeah, and you know, it's making it relatable, right? I'll let Ruben like, bring it home. But you know, what I, I came up to this issue, I was presenting on a general plan and we were talking with a community that was um, being asked to look at density for the first time. And I was getting pushback on that because it's like, we don't want those people, you know, the same conversations that we hear. And I'm, I'm leading their general plan update and I put a time out and I said, you guys, I'm one of those people, I'm a renter. I live in these spaces that you're not wanting to have. So it's not like putting context again on what is, when you're talking about affordable, the affordability, what does that mean? Who lives here? Would your kids be able to come back? Do you want them to be able to afford a place to live in the place that they grew up? And if not, I mean, that's what we're finding is that, you know, parents are having their kids not be able to, to find a place to come back to. So finding those things that resonate with people, just those little, you know, and some people just haven't ever had this conversation and don't understand what it is, what's, what incomes are, what it costs for housing, that sort of thing. And then, then I turn around and I ask them, 
how would you solve this? If, if your child is not able to come back and live here, is it just that they go live somewhere else? Or do we try to find ways to do that? And then it gives them pause for a minute. And it means they have to kind of expand their horizons just a little bit. But that's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conversations yeah. to have. Yeah, so I'll, I'll add a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, I think the value of interdependence, uh, obviously, you know, is not a new thing, but I think, that is something that we need to talk about in across jurisdictions. We really are interdependent. And the more we buy into that value, the more we'll be able to accomplish more together. So we, you know, we do that because we, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm just remember a couple of years ago, we actually had a joint kind of study uh, session with Palo Alto City Council. There was a Palo Alto City Council and the East Palo Alto City Council, you know, Two totally different communities and, and sort of economics and other stuff. And you know, I started out by saying that uh, let's focus on the community process engagement and, and then the politics. But there is the politics too, and I think that is a reality that is in play, and we shouldn't you know shy away from it. Uh, it deals with power. Who's got the power to decide what? So some communities are much more polarized uh, on the issue of housing. Others are more at one end or the other or in between. But I think we, when we approach it, as, as all of us have been saying, you know, there are certain values that we probably all agree. It's just a matter of trying to uh, get, get to them in a way that, that it's a win-win for us now and for the future. Because now, in the past, in a way, we can be critical of each other from the past, but I'd rather focus on now and what we can do. So that interdependence value, I think, can hopefully help us too. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go back to my screen share here just for a couple of minutes. I've got some resources to share with the folks that are still on the line. If I can get my screen share to work with me here. Um, so as I mentioned at the, the front end of this webinar, um, this is part of a series. So we've got um, three more sessions coming up, one on climate resi resilient land use policies and how that interacts with housing, uh, one on housing strategies to help with uh, the homelessness crisis. And then we're going to wrap up the series um, closing out, talking about new laws and new funding that's available um, coming out of this legislative session. Um, also want to share with you all that we have a uh, an intensive public engagement training. So. Um, this can be applied to a lot of different topics, but if you're interested in learning more just on the public engagement strategies and ideas and um, tools and tricks, um, definitely to, uh, check this out. This is all available on our website, too, and registration is now open. Our social handles to find out more, and then let me get our contact information up here for anybody who wants to follow up. Um, and if um, I, my panelists will give me just another minute or two of their time, I would love to close out with just one final question. Um, about advice or what you wish you'd known. So is there any any one piece of advice or one thing that you wish you'd known before you started um, engaging on on housing or what, what would you share with your colleagues um, in terms of that one kind of nugget of something you wish you knew or one piece of advice? Um, Wendy, can I, can I start with you? I know you have a lot of experience in this space. <laughs> Well, I think I was thinking about it, you know, and just from this like uh, outreach agility kind of thing. Sometimes, you know, you have all the best laid plans. You have put the laptops at the community centers with translators. You have used your community connectors. You have done all the things, you know, like going to the people where they are, digitally, in person, whatever. And you still sometimes just don't get the people <laughs> that you want. And sometimes it's just, you know, and you just keep evaluating and looking at it. Um, and so it's it's just, you don't have to over pitch what you're doing, you know, just you're trying to find all those spots, you're looking and you just have to keep working at it. But yeah, I think that's the last part is that, you know, when I was talking about like marketing, you don't have to like push the idea or make it like super shiny. You just have to market the process, market the conversation, market the connecting the community, that sort of thing. Because then over time you build those relationships and then people start to trust government again and know how the channels that they're supposed to be engaged with. So I wish I had lots more nuggets, but that's, that's what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> I think you shared a lot of nuggets. I appreciate that. Um, Zilo, any thoughts from you? 
Yeah, I am going to cheat and put multiple nuggets into my comment here. So, um, But number one, I think knowing that your job as a staff person is to educate and facilitate, like you are there to make sure people know what they're supposed to be talking about and make sure they're talking to each other. And that's a great way to sort of turn down the dial on a conversation. And it helps with nimbyism too, is if you have two people in a room who have to talk to each other and they're both members of the community and they have very different realities and very different opinions and they need to work it out. Like we're just there to support that. Um, it doesn't all have to be top down. Um, yeah, and just, you know, meeting design matters, trying to make more of it about community conversation than just telling them what you're doing and why you're doing it is really key to the work that we do. Definitely. Thank you so much. Ruben, do you want to close this out? <laughs> yes, you know, I actually had a conversation with a couple of our staff, uh, and I definitely enjoy that on, on, on these topics, you know. so. I'll combine one of the things they said uh, and, and, and for me. So one is, um, you know, I guess community engagement is always an uphill, it's always an uphill struggle. And, and sort of, it's not that it's low expectation, but knowing that, that you may not get a lot of people to respond. You may not get a lot of people to participate. And that's just the starting point, you know. Uh, and, and for me also, uh, to keep relearning or reminding myself as an elected official to, to go to the community, not wait for them to come to us, but to go where people are. So go to their meetings and talk about that. Go to where the people will sort of naturally already congregate, whether it's the churches, whether it's the festivals, whether it's their clubs, whatever it is that people already do as a group, that's where you go. You go to them. Don't wait for them to always come to us. Anyway. Oh, that's a great point and a great tip as well. Um, so I want to thank each of you um, for sharing your expertise and your experience with us this afternoon. Really appreciate that. Um, thank, you, thank you to everybody that's on the line for joining us this afternoon. Um, hopefully you got a little bit of uh, some, some key nuggets or takeaways out of this. And definitely, again, feel free to follow up with us if we didn't get to your question. Um, and I hope that everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night.